take roll? Yes, Madam President, all members of the board are present. Please stand and join us in the pledge. We have moved the flag so everybody can see it now. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Before we get started with business, I wanted to take a few moments to share a message of appreciation with Dr. Beresford and the staff at CCS. Um, COVID-19 has been an unprecedented challenge to all of us in Carmel Clay schools at every level and the transition from a hybrid model of instruction to full-time in-person instruction has produced a great deal of discussion among the entire Carmel Clay School family. The school board received many comments from the community, which I have responded to on behalf of the school board in a timely fashion. Our commitment has always been to put safety of our students, our teachers, our employees first, and communicate clearly with our stakeholders. It is worth bearing in mind that Dr. Beresford responded to this ever-changing landscape with professionalism and transparency on March 8th, 2021, when he indicated that Carmel Clay Schools was responding to a consistent downward tick in COVID-19 cases by investigating if a safe transition to full-time in-person instruction for 6th through 12th grade was possible this academic year. <clears throat> Dr. Beresford and his team, in conjunction with the Carmel Teachers Association, performed an exhaustive review of all options and possibilities. Dr. Beresford has now very promptly come back to the Carmel Clay School Board and our school community with a clear answer that we cannot safely change from our current hybrid plan for 6th through 12th grade this academic year. On behalf of the school board, I want to thank Dr. Beresford, our Carmel Clay School COVID-19 response team, our Carmel Clay School administrators and professional educators, and our CTA partners for their consistent and focused efforts with students and staff safety as our number one priority. I want to also thank our students, our teachers, and our community members who have participated in this discussion as well. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda, we have our presentation. And tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Ms. Jennifer Penix, thank you, Jennifer, from the Carmel, uh, Carmel Education Foundation. Ms. Penix. Good evening from the Carmel Education Foundation. Um, my name is Jen Penix, and it is my privilege to be here tonight. I'm the director of the foundation. It is my privilege to be here tonight to recognize 43 teachers who individually or as a group received a Great Idea grant from the foundation this spring. We know that this year has been tough. It has stretched everyone, especially our teachers, and we are grateful that they took the time to prepare thoughtful applications in an effort to benefit kids across the district. When selecting which grants to fund, consideration is always given as to how a grant idea aligns with the mission of the foundation, which is to support Carmel Clay students in academic achievement and lifelong learning. Hence, CEF invests in grants that support innovation, enhance student achievement, and inspire student learning. It is now my pleasure to introduce our 43 grant geniuses. And this is the sign that they all have on their doors around the district. So if you see this on a, a store and you know a grant genius uh, resides there, at least during the day. Okay. Our first uh, projects are from the school district. Jay Kirshner, a familiar name here, uh, from Carmel High Schools did a Fun Friday bus project. And our first ever DEI lending library is being spearheaded by Terry Roberts Leonard. Next, at Carmel High School, 
Jocelyn Cole is bringing some innovation to her uh, class with the World War II Home Front and the British Resolve Project. And Kimberly Johnson is doing a dive, diving deeper, implementing understandings of equity, SEL, and brain-based learning. Still at the high school, we have Kristen Mullins, who's doing some creative work in making sure that students transitioning into the high school are well taken care of and understood. Rebecca McBride is doing comprehensible input book fun in her Spanish classes. Um, that sounds uh, like a very fun project. The social communication curriculum project is spearheaded by Emily Nadeau. And over at Carmel Middle School, Becky Owens, her Divide, Conquer, and Win the Day project is making sure that all the students in their classrooms have safe places and where they feel uh, comfortable for their learning environment. Slide into Sensitized Learning is a team from Mohawk Trails, and it's Holly Meyer, Erica Goodwin, Kelsey Livingston, and Jen Marshall are working on this collaborative effort. Over at Cherry Tree Elementary, we have Jennifer Conley is putting together kits, Feeling Buddies classroom kits, kind of really working on making sure that students are heard and that their emotions uh, are felt. Uh, and Jennifer Marble is kind of taking that social-emotional support, support to a different level or a higher level for the classroom family and leading some book discussions within her, um, with her colleagues. Tools for the social toolbox, kind of taking the same thing and expanding it across the district, are Jared Piper and Ann Sweet. They work with multiple schools and will be taking those resources with them um, as they work with students across the district. At Cherry Tree Elementary, Anna Moody is the music game plan with some specialized, super fun learning uh, ideas for particularly K through two. And Lisa Lewis at Collegewood is doing Rocking Robotics, a STEM experience in her uh, high ability second grade classroom. And that will also translate to all of the other second graders in that uh, school as well. Luck of the Draw is a whole curriculum or a whole project based on probability, learning probability. And so that is uh, with Josh Lowe and Kristen Pyron at Creekside Middle. Math Facts Toolkit, Cindy Meyer and Kay Sharp at Orchard Park are making sure that we're taking our everyday math curriculum and making sure that kids have all the tools and resources to really plug in and understand what those math facts are. And that's primarily for kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. Christine Amick at Orchard Park is doing the Teva Contractions Architecture and Design Kit. It's like ramped up kind of Lego building block, very cool thing. And Sarah Harding at Prairie Trace is saying to implement a Seesaw for All program in the fall. Marilyn Voker at Town Meadow is taking very good care of all of the virtual students from Town Meadow and putting together a safe place self-regulation packet. So these have already gone out to all of the students, any students with a uh, virtual student at Town Meadow, making sure they have some of those same resources at home that they might have had in their classrooms. Science of Reading is Tracy Hastings at Prairie Trace Elementary, really digging into how and why, uh, what inspires students for reading, uh, and how to, as educators, how to motivate the, those inspirations for reading. And Sarah Ah is looking at diverse books, doors to our world, increasing their library, particularly in the fantasy genre realm, and making sure the authors uh, are representative of the students' interests. Early Childhood Diversity, Inclusion, and Implicit Bias, this is for our earliest learners, our, edu our uh, early childhood program at Forestdale Elementary. Richard Liu, Christine, uh, Krista Coleman King, and Julie Arnold are working with these young children to make sure that their uh, these ideas are instilled at an early age. Counseling through COVID, kind of continuing on that counseling type theme, is Dow Schweitzer and Jamie Pistorius uh, looking at some very um, hands-on, excellent tools for. Uh, engaging all students at, at Orchard Park. Uh, Aaron Meyer at Clay Middle is organizing a group of students to implement a coffee cart. And so it is an opportunity for students to work together to learn how to socialize with each other, the economics of creating a, a business, and then all the teachers and the staff will get to benefit from that because they'll get to be uh, to purchase the, that coffee cart when that is up and running. So. Be sure to visit Clay on those days. Um, and then Steffi, Steffi McCourt is taking seventh grade students outside to do book clubs, unplugging, putting them on blankets, letting them have blankets, going out there and really talking about being mindful and aware of your presence. So Mindful in the Middle is a book club. Carmel Elementary is uh, 
very strong focus on cultural awareness. Uh, so Holly Adams is doing creating a cultural awareness book in increasing the library of those books. And then Allie Lewis is leading some teaching groups on culturally, culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Back at Carmel or Clay Middle, uh, Ryan Snyder is taking a, a program that had been started a couple years ago on podcasting. They realized they really needed to amp this up, uh, needed some additional equipment and some additional resources so they could answer your question podcast. Um, and Gina Potter is also uh, at Clay Middle, and she is creating a space for anybody that if you just kind of need a couple minutes or you need to regroup or calm yourself, that it's uh, an opportunity to have that resource at their school. Self-regulation, kind of along those same lines, self-regulation is Superflex at Katie Bilkemeyer, Tim Hale, and Mandy Spurgeon at Carmel Elementary are leading that initiative. And if you have visited Carmel Middle School, or if you go to visit, you're going to see some black big uh, art cases down the hallways now that are uh, showcasing artwork from students, and that's from the Masterpiece Project led by Emily Ergot and Claire Hawkins. So we want to thank our teachers for all of their ideas, their initiatives. We're pretty excited to be part of, we're in uh, 13 of the schools had a grant this uh, go round, and we look forward to bringing grants back in the fall. So thank you very much. Jennifer, I'm actually going to open the floor up to questions. I wanted to oh, first fine. launch a huge thank you. We really appreciate and value the relationship that the Education Foundation has with our Carmel Clay School System. And we are very fortunate for the way these grants really enhance what's happening in the classroom, the way you support our professional educators and students alike. And Katie. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for supporting our teachers and our staff. Um, my first question is, can you explain a little bit, um, for those who don't know, about how the Carmel Education Foundation gets their funding and how if people want to help that, what they can do and where they can go. I would be delighted to tell you <laughs> all about that, yes. Uh, in fact, all of these grants that we talked about are primarily, we receive funding from individual donations. On our website is the easiest way to do that. We also receive, we host events such as the Ghosts and Goblins race. Uh, in April, we're going to have our showcase, which is an event, and that's an opportunity to donate as well. The showcase is a musical showcase of all of our elementary and middle schools have musical groups that this year is going to be virtual, so a little bit of a different take. Um, and then we do some partnerships with our community for either sponsorships or grants within businesses, um, small businesses, some larger corporations, et cetera. So, but we really, we, a lot of it is individual donations and funding, and our grant program is primarily driven by uh, donations from our community. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Penix. Absolutely. And we look My forward pleasure. to our continued relationship. Oh, it will be great. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, seeing that we do not have anybody wishing to participate in public comment, is consent. And on consent this evening, we have our personnel report, claims and payroll. We have our approval of gifts. We have two significant gifts. Um, one, the, Am the Amgen Foundation donated $500 to Cherry Tree Elementary as a matching gift um, for the volunteer hours at Abigail Oblansky. No, Obanansky. Sorry to butcher your name, Miss Abigail, um, for her volunteer work in the Cherry Tree Media Center. And then the Carmel High School PTO also donated $2,000 to the Carmel High School Media Center. We have four sets of minutes from March 8th, March 17th, oh, February 8th, February 17th, February 22nd, executive session, and then February 22nd, our regular session. May I get a motion on the table to approve consent? So moved. Thank you, Pam. Second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor of supporting consent, signify by saying aye and raising your hand, please. Aye. aye. Thank you. Motion carries 5-0. Next on the agenda, we have a public hearing. So at this time, I do need a motion to suspend the regular board meeting to open a consolidated public hearing regarding three items. The need for the 2021 through 2023 facility projects, including the renovation and expansion of the Educational Service Center. 
a lease between the Carmel Clay Building Corporation and the Carmel Clay Schools, and an additional appropriation not to exceed $25,600,000. May I get a motion on the table to suspend the meeting? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor of suspending the current meeting, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Anyone denied? Motion carries. Mr. McMichael, to you. Thank you. Um, um, this is an opportunity for public uh, input or comment regarding uh, the three uh, uh, areas that you uh, referenced. And uh, so with that, I'd recommend that you give that opportunity to any members of the public that would like to address any, any of the three issues. Thank you, Mr. McMichael. At this time, then, I will offer members of the public an opportunity to make comments regarding these three plans. And seeing that there's nobody wishing to make comment from the public, may I have a motion to close this public hearing? So moved. Thank you, Pam. Second? Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. All those in favor of closing the hearing, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. So we'll return to our regular business meeting. Our first action item in our regular business meeting is resolution opposing educational savings accounts and voucher expansion. To that, we turn to Dr. Bearsford. Thank you. Uh, as many are aware of, uh, there's recent legislation in, uh, in with our lawmakers that uh, has passed through the House, and it is a uh, law to expand the voucher program, which was originally placed in, in service in Indiana by the legislature to help um, low, low uh, uh, kids on uh, people with lower economic issues with uh, in, on free and reduced lunch and they were uh, offered these um, vouchers so that they could uh, use that money and attend private schools. Uh, the vouchers now in law have been uh, uh, have been expanded over 300 percent where people making up the words of 150 170 thousand dollars a year would be eligible for for vouchers. Another thing that's on the uh, it's it's been it's moved over to the Senate is a a uh, the creation of a a uh, school a savings account basically and uh, what uh, the purpose of that is is that uh, a certain amount of money that, uh, up into the the whole amount that a, a student would be funded to go to public school would be put into a, a an account and the parents could use that to attend private school or put it into some kind of uh, services for their child um, and with really not much accountability at all um, and so um, so there's a lot of disturbing parts about that, as we've talked about before. But one of them is that uh, you know that public schools in Indiana serve between 90 and 95 percent of the students in Indiana, and uh, and the idea that uh, is on the table by lawmakers is to siphon off about 30 percent of that and put it into uh, this voucher program, or, you know, or the the savings plan uh, programs, and uh, so 90, you know, over 90 percent of the of the public schools will will have that huge decrease in funding, and uh, and if there's ever a time not to do that, it would be during a pandemic, and also at a time where we just uh, you know we just uh, had a report by the governor's office on several different things we need to get public you know our public school teachers um, the salaries uh, they deserve and that that to help us catch up with the other states around Indiana. And uh, so it's just extremely poor timing uh, because that taking that money away from public schools and siphoning it off to those programs uh, would essentially make it extremely difficult to, you know, to give a raise to the teachers that the, the governor promised. So there's just a whole lot of problems with it. So um, based on that, um, we've, uh, you know, for your, uh, the board has chosen to, to do a resolution opposing uh, both the expansion of the vouchers and the, the educational savings accounts. And, uh, and I, if one of the, would you like to read that resolution to the, uh, the public or, or I'd be glad to do that as well. Um, 
I am happy to read it, or Dr. Beresford, you could mm -hmm. certainly read it because I know the board will have several comments. All right. Uh, what it says, it's a resolution opposing educational savings accounts and voucher expansion. It says, the families of Carmel Clay Schools value public education and all that it does and has done for our community, our state, and our country. Carmel Clay Schools values our educators and all educators across Indiana. Whereas, the Indiana General Assembly during its 2021 legislative session is considering multiple legislative proposals and bills that divert resources away from public education through the establishment of education savings accounts, ESAs, and the expanded voucher programs. Whereas, the board has determined that the Indiana General Assembly should not enact educational savings accounts or expand vouchers and should continue to promote and fully invest in Indiana's public schools, especially in a time of statewide financial uncertainty. Whereas the state of Indiana has already uh, has school choice in the form of open enrollment, charter schools, enrollment in virtual online schools, and the choice scholarship program. Whereas the cost of the educational savings accounts and school vouchers are covered exclusively by our state's school tuition support fund, further providing fewer public dollars for public school systems to elevate the educational profile of the entire state. Whereas siphoning of resources away from public education precludes investment in much needed teacher training, social emotional supports, education, special education resources, and increases in teacher compensation. Whereas the board believes the public, that public schools provide a strong educational environment for Indiana's children and educational savings accounts, if enacted, and expanded school vouchers would put this environment at risk by directing resources away from those schools to programs that are not subject to the same rigorous scrutiny for their use of taxpayer resources. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the School Board of Carmel Clay Schools opposes the passage and signing of any proposal that seeks to expand the voucher threshold or create educational savings accounts. Thank you, Dr. Beresford, for presenting to the public the resolution that the board has created. I would like to get a motion on the table to approve this resolution before we have discussion. May I get a motion? So moved. Thank you, Katie. May I get a second? Second. Thank you, Pam. Let's open up for discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, last time that I saw, we Carmel Clay Schools was the second lowest funded school district in the state of Indiana. And, and because of that, we right now have two, ref, we have one referendum that are operating and then we did another for our safety. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of, let's say it's 30% was deducted from our funding, if it was a, a direct 30% cut or something similar, what would that look like for Carmel Clay Schools? Um, it's hard to be able to put an exact number on it. Um, I mean, you could you could fathom that if you take 30% out of the, the funding that we'd be down 30%, but I, I doubt that would be the case um, because it really has a lot to do with um, how the funds are dispersed is how much will be the um, the, fun, the foundation amount versus the complexity. And Mr. McMichael, did you want to – I saw you reaching for your mic. You, 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 this is well, his wheelhouse. Our um, funding from the state in round numbers is about $100 million, so – by whatever percentage you like, and, and uh, if you can see that it's <clears throat> it's very significant. Our local referendum, however, is also about 15 percent of our our local funding. So essentially, what's happened is is, is uh, when the laws were changed, the funding was changed to go uh, entirely by the state. Um, to the extent the state did not were not was not able to provide the funds that Carmel felt in our community felt that we needed, um, our community fortunately uh, chose to tax themselves additionally, uh, that additional 15 percent. We, we received right at $20 million a year additional funding at the local level because of the referendum. And um, um, we certainly wouldn't have the educational program that we have today if it weren't for that local support. So and that, and I might it's add very that, significant. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I would add that, and, and we're not talking just about Carmel Clay Schools with this resolution. We're actually joining um, almost every, if not all, public schools in Indiana uh, with uh, these resolutions opposing the, the, the vouchers and the, the, uh, the savings accounts. Um, there's a lot of districts in Indiana that can't pass a referendum. Uh, they, their communities aren't in a position to do that. We're fortunate that here we're able to do that. Uh, but uh, this this could be have a devastating effect on on districts where th that opportunity doesn't exist. Uh, the other piece is I shared with you at the last board meeting that uh, we have a teacher crisis, uh, and um, this could very well really discourage even more um, students from wanting to become teachers, or if they want to become teachers, not to serve in, in Indiana, to go to some of the surrounding states where uh, they can make a better living. So uh, there's a lot of complexity to the you know the problem, but. Uh, but this is this is really a. Uh, it's kind of hard to figure out w what the real purpose of this is. That it's not good for Indiana. I just wanted to comment, just really to what you had said, Dr. Beresford, as well as um, what we have been learning through this. You know, the governor, when he made his address at the beginning of the year, um, really was focusing on our teachers and the state of teaching in, in Indiana, and that our teachers need to be compensated, not rewarded, but compensated for the work that they do. And both, the, both of the, the expansion of the vouchers as well as development of these ESAs really siphons off a significant portion of the public dollar for private institutions. And that is not what our governor had suggested and that certainly isn't what we support. So I am, I think along with our board members, completely support this resolution. Um, the Indiana School Board Association has had you know, a great deal of conversations with other school districts to better understand their positioning. And most, like you said, most school districts in the state of Indiana have adopted a resolution to send a message. And we are hoping that if we do pass this resolution that not only our re representatives and senators understand that we really value public education and we want to see our tax dollar used more effectively for 90% of the students in the state of Indiana, but we're hoping it sends a message across the state as well. Um, I guess that's all I have to share at this moment. Do others have Mike? Well, I, I think I want to piggyback on uh, Dr. Beresford has been telling us all along about how important it is to make Indiana a teacher-friendly state and how detrimental this could be towards it. And I guess the question I have is, where do these funds come from that um, are used to fund, fund education? Primarily come from sales tax and income tax um, in terms of the state funding. And so... When we have you know, a pandemic, for example, or a recession, uh, those are the first funds to be affected. People lose their jobs. They obviously aren't paying income tax. Um, and if they have less money, they're you know, selling, buying fewer things and, and thus less sales tax, and, um, which is exactly what happened in 2009 and 10 uh, when, the, when the change was made to 100% state funding. Uh, then, so we went six years, um, each year less funding actual dollars than we had the year before. And it wasn't until seven years into that that uh, the seventh year we finally um, had just slightly more dollars than we had the six years prior. So, and these, so these aren't local property taxes that are being taken away to go wherever they're going to go. These are funds from across the state that tax everybody um, that are going to be, to use the word, siphoned away from public education. But what happened in, when, when this change was made, um, sales tax was increased. And so the residents everywhere, including Carmel, uh, are not, have been paying more in sales tax but then, as I said earlier, um, our community um, agreed to tax itself additionally with 
essentially a property tax. And as Dr. Beersford noted, uh, we're, we're want, it can seem like typical around in Hamilton County, but the fact is there's about 50 districts that have operating referendums out of about 300 school districts. So the vast majority of them do not have that, 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 uh, that uh, local funding. Are there other questions before we take a vote on supporting the resolution? Yes, Pam. Um, I think I heard that if this passes, or even if it doesn't pass, that the burden of putting, or, or the burden of adding to the teachers' salaries will be put on the, on the school systems, and they have to look for ways to um, cut their budget so that the teachers can get a salary increase. Is that correct? Essentially, yes, because uh, since the formula um, provides for a specific amount of money, um, whether it addresses the need or not. So that leaves a local school district with the dilemma as to how much we're going to pay our staff, um, in, this, in the case of teachers also, uh, how many we're going to have, because um, that's just a kind of a polite way of saying that if we if we raise salaries, then the higher we raise the salaries, the fewer teachers that we can pay. And that, of course, results in higher class size, higher people-teacher ratio. So the two goals are in total conflict with each other, and they're after the same dollar. And so it leaves a local school board with that dilemma. Uh, we all want to provide the best education we can, uh, and certainly our teachers want to do that, but they're not volunteers. They have families and, and children of their own. And um, like everybody else, they need to make a, a livable wage. Mike? So I guess I just want to clarify. So we want, if we pass this resolution, we are going to share it with our own legislators and um, people uh, on the Education Committee and those people that we normally reach out to in the la in the legislature. Yes, House um, Ways and Means as well. Yes. Okay, and then um, everybody. As, as, as has already been said, we are not going to be the first or the last. That hopefully every district uh, will be doing so. So um, I think it's important to note that we are all going to be actually signing this to show our individual support as board members. And I think it'd be important to put our new logo and our new um, tagline on it as well, just to show that it's together we achieve not just Carmel Clay Schools, but all public education and the great things that public education has done for our state, our community, and our country. Agree. Thank you very much, Mike. Other questions or comments before we take a vote? Seeing none, we will take a vote at this point in time. All those in favor of the resolution opposing educational savings accounts and voucher expansion, please signify by saying aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have a resolution to actually authorize the administration to handle work disruptions for employees impacted by the coronavirus. Dr. Beresford. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and I'll explain this one and also I'll do the next one, uh, you know, to save maybe a little bit of time. But um, we, this is the, uh, I believe, the third round we've done on these resolutions. And uh, these were recommend to us, recommended to us by uh, Church Churchill and Antrim, our, our legal services. Um, when uh, the governor uh, first did his order a year ago uh, this month, um, uh, some of the things that were in the order could be in conflict with some of our policies and procedures. So we want to do a resol the recommendation was to do a resolution so that uh, we would suspend our policies and, and uh, procedures if they were in conflict with that order from the governor. The other piece of it was um, a resolution uh, that would allow administration to handle work disruptions for employees impacted by coronavirus. An example of that might be um, currently if a uh, an employee contracts COVID-19, they can have up to 10 days to, to deal with uh, uh, days off of work, paid leaves off, uh, to deal with that, that would not be subtracted from their sick leave or their personal leave, uh, which is pretty critical for some of our families. And uh, so that would be an example of something that we did uh, to deal with that work disruption. 
Um, that was by law in the first semester of the year, but it was not in the second semester for the year. So we wanted to do that for our employees. So it would be a situation if we were ever needed to uh, to make some kind of a a change that you would we have that authorization to do that, and we would uh, be able to keep our our people uh, in in a good position moving forward. Uh, I would doubt that we'll use uh, these resolutions. We have not had to use them other than just a few few pieces here and there, as we've discussed over the last year. But it's I also think it's probably good to go ahead and have these resolutions in place through the end of the year. Uh, as this, uh, as we're coming towards the finish line, we still are in a pandemic, and uh, and we don't know what to expect. Uh, we're still in a, a uh, you know, in that situation we've described as chronic uncertainty. Uh, so uh, our recommendation is to to pass these resolutions, so we'll be prepared just in case, and I hope we never have to use them again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beresford. May I get a motion on the table? to approve the resolution authorizing the administration to handle work disruptions for employees impacted by coronavirus. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mike. Discussion. Um, the only thing I'd like to comment, sorry about that, I dropped my phone. Um, while you had said it is unlikely that we will need to use this, the fact that we still have a state of emergency established by our governor, I think we should keep something similar to this um, enacted through the state of emergency. So thank you for bringing this to us. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we will go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of supporting the resolution authorizing the administration to handle work disruptions for employees impacted by coronavirus signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Motion carries 5-0. Next on our agenda is a resolution authorizing the suspension of policies and procedures in conflict with current law. And Dr. Beresford, thank you for already sharing information about this. May I get a motion on the table to approve the resolution authorizing the suspension of policies and procedures in conflict with current law? So moved. Thank you, Pam. Second. Thank you, Katie. Discussion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of supporting the resolution authorizing the suspension of policies and procedures in conflict with current law, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries 5-0. Next on our agenda, we have the adoption of a resolution confirming the lease and other actions and the adoption of the resolution of additional appropriations. Mr. McMichael. Thank you. This is the action item then that reflects uh, the, the topics uh, provided for in the public hearing. So we would recommend your approval. Thank you. May I get a motion on the table to adopt the attached resolution regarding the lease between Carmel Clay School Building Corporation and the school district and approve the appropriation of funds from the proceeds of the bond issued by the building corporation? Second. Second. Thank you, Pam. Discussion. Thank you. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. Seeing that we do not have any discussion at this time, we will go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of adopting the resolution, please signify by saying aye. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> aye. <laughs> any opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Next on the agenda, we have the ESC addition and replacement of finishes. That we turn to Mr. McMichael. Thank you. Uh, we are recommending that the board um, approve an addition and replacement of finishes in the Educational Service Center. Uh, we discussed this previously. It would be a part of the funding would be part of the uh, um, the bond issue that that you just approved the resolution for, and um, this is. More than half of this project is is uh, replacing the finishes in the in the existing building, and then the other part is a, is an addition of about three thousand square feet. And so that provides thirteen additional offices. Uh, we have, I believe, nine uh, individuals now working out of cubicles, and and um, that's not worked very well um, over time. That as we uh, those positions really um, 
need more privacy to, to do their job. And then we also have ha added additional positions over the past 15 years, uh, some of the most recent of which would be the um, our, our mental health coordinator uh, and our diversity officer. And we're soon to be adding, well, we've actually added a supervisor for our SORO officers or police officers um, as we've expanded. Uh, as you know, we've expanded our, the number of SROs that we have in the school system. So, so we'd recommend you approve this uh, this of this project. Thank you, Mr. McMichael. Make it a motion on the table to approve the addition and the replacement of finishes at the Educational Service Center. Second. Thank you, Mike. Question. Pam. Yes, would you uh, remind us how this is going to be paid? Yes, it's it will be paid from um, from the bond funds uh, that we have just referred to. Uh, we sold what's um, referred to as premium some premium bonds, which generates more than the original um, amount of the bond issue, and so um, there there was not an impact to our tax rate for that. It's just a part of the financing. That's, that's how this project will be funded. Okay, so this is not, uh, this is, is this attached to the lease that we just had a resolution on? It will not direct, it will not be attached to the lease because we will not, uh, what will happen is, is that the, the building corporation will, will purchase uh, certain property uh, at Carmel High School and we will take the proceeds of that, uh, but not all the, not the entire high school. And so we will, uh, there'll be certain portions, um, the, the property, for example, where the parking and the, and the natatorium, second natatorium will be, um, and in the performing arts area where the addition for the performing arts area. So that is an example that we will sell that property to the holding corporation, um, and then, um, we will use the proceeds and put it back into the project, all of it, uh, including this building. And so the holding corporation, um, we won't sell this property to the holding corporation. So indirectly, we're using funds from that, but but it, but this property will not be part of that lease. Okay, this property will not be part of the lease. Correct. Okay. And uh, it is necessary to have all of these um, office spaces. Yeah, I might. If uh, Colleen can pull this up, I'll, I'll show you. So I don't know if you can see that very well, but um, uh, this this is the addition, and and um, it will house. Almost all of that is housing um, our, some of our IT staff, uh, technology staff, and then we have in the front part of it is um, locations for um, I believe it's eight, eight of our instructional coaches. And of course, they work out in the building, as you might imagine, uh, but this is kind of their home base, and um, so so um, this this is the addition. Do they have an office in their in the building do, in which they're assigned? That I don't, I don't believe so. Um, these are instructional coaches that work at all buildings throughout the district. Um, so like um, some of the people you saw that received the grants, Jared Piper and um, Ann Sweet and Gay Kirshner, they work throughout all of the buildings and we want this to be their home base. Okay, thank you. I would point out the new construction is just the, the the offices that you see that go from our right as we're looking at to the left to the wall there. So it's just the one, two, three, four, five offices uh, on the north side of that, and then the, the five below. That's the new part that's going to be built. Uh, and the part on the other side of the wall is, is reconfigured, uh, you know, to make better use of that space where all the cubicles were. So. Uh, and we do have a, a lot of people working in, uh, in in cubicles and in spaces where really confidentiality is not where, what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And then about five, the, the bottom portion is 
uh, to the right is about 500 square feet of storage space. Um, right now we have uh, our maintenance staff works out of what used to be the warehouse. It's still a warehouse, but it's uh, we use it differently than when it was originally built. Um, but as like instructional materials will come and th and they'll they're on the dock and then the, they're in the they're in the way of of the maintenance operation. We also have food service operating back there. We have freezer coolers and, and so forth. And so uh, we need some additional space so that we can move those items uh, as they come in. And so about 500 to 3,000 square feet is, is storage. Are there a, Kim? One more. What is the bottom area where it says uh, specialist, uh, backup specialist? It's next to the warehouse expansion? Oh, yes, that's uh, another IT person, but it's also the space. Uh, they, they uh, um, some of our equipment that's being uh, either repaired and so forth is, is so it's, it's partially a storage area for IT equipment as well as there is one person that. Uh, okay, because I thought that was quite large for just one person. Yeah, no, it's primarily uh, uh, equipment. Mike? So I think it was last, was it last month or when you explained to us the reason that we do this type of leaseback thing is it's a function of state law? Yes. Uh, well, yes. Be, a school district in Indiana is limited to no more than 2% of the assessed value uh, of property in the community. So when you do, when a, any school district does large projects like we're talking about, um, you cannot uh, have that indebtedness be general obligation bonds directly to the school district. So from a legal perspective, um, the Carmel Clay Schools Building Corporation is a separate legal entity, and so it's that entity that is holding the debt. And, and their sole purpose is, in, in these projects, for example, their sole purpose is to to build an addition, a performing arts addition, for example, at the high school, and um, and then lease that property because we've sold them the property, so they're going to lease that building to the school corporation, and the, and the lease payments are exactly the the amount of the debt service payments that repay the bonds, and then and then when the bonds are paid off, um, then then the property uh, goes to the school corporation. So that's all predetermined uh, in in this process, and, and uh, every school district in the state um, uh, utilizes that if they have large projects. And the reason for the uh, the uh, limitation of the debt, by the way, is because Indiana is a state that the state backs up the local debt, so um, which makes it makes our bonds very attractive because uh, if a local school district in this case were to to fail to pay the for the bonds, then the state's obligated to uh, to make those payments. So the entire state would have to go bankrupt before there'd be a problem for a bondholder. Um, so, but it also puts that limitation on the direct debt to the school district. Okay, thank you. And then also by combining um, this department, we're going to free up spaces throughout the rest of this building for the people that you've said don't have offices or that we've added over time. That. Well, we're not freeing up offices so much. Um, we're primarily providing enclosed offices for the majority of the people that are in that are in cubicle, and then. But we also need uh, some a few additional offices. For example, for the the um, the um, SRO, the lieutenant for the uh, oversees the SROs, um, and then as we've added the uh, most recently the. Um, our diversity officer, uh, and and then prior to that, the mental health coordinator um, that's overseeing our therapy program that we've recently put in place. Uh, so so we needed a, a, a few more offices for additional positions, but most of these offices are are just providing better space for people that are already here. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Are there other questions this evening? 
Okay, seeing no further questions, we'll go ahead and take a vote. We have a motion on the table right now to approve the addition and replacement of finishes. All those in favor of supporting the addition and replacement of finishes at the Educational Service Center, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Next on the agenda, we have a series of change orders. I had a discussion with Roger, so we're going to take these as a grouping. We have change orders 6.6 .6 through 611. Change orders to Clay, Elementary, um, Clay Center Elementary School, the new Carmel Elementary School, the Carmel High School Interior Renovations, Units A and B, Collegewood Elementary School Finishes and Renovations, Carmel High School boiler, boiler One Replacement, and Woodbrook Elementary School Security and Access Upgrades. Mr. McMichael. Thank you. Uh, so you've identified the schools that are uh, associated with these change orders, and then two of the change orders are what we refer to as closeout change orders. They're uh, uh, projects that are finished that had uh, unused allowances, and so those are uh, both VDAC change orders. Thank you very much, Mr. Happy Mr. to respond to any questions okay. you might have on specific. Schools. Okay, so I'm going to first. I'm going to get a motion on the table. Okay, I get a motion on the table to approve change orders 6.6 .6 through 6.11. Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion. Questions. The floor is open. Well, you did a great job explaining it in yeah. your comment to the board. <laughs> Um, <laughs> as well as the data that you've provided to us. So with that, we will go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of supporting the change orders, which includes a couple closeout orders for Clay Center, the New Carmel Elementary, Carmel High School Interior, College Wood Elementary School, the Carmel High School Boiler, and Woodbrook Elementary School, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, everybody. That was very speedy quick. President Spannenberg, if I could just, uh, yes. before you get away from this topic, I just want to throw a kudos out to Ron, who's scooting out the back door there, <laughs> and uh, and to Roger and his team for uh, just doing an excellent job. Um, you know, they've managed um, to keep our buildings looking wonderful, uh, building new buildings, new spaces. Um, some of the projects that are going on now, the building hasn't been touched since 1993. And we're a lot bigger than we were in 1993. And uh, to build all that up, the taxes aren't going up. Uh, the rates are incredibly low. And we're going to have these debts paid off, most of them, less than 10 years, uh, which most times in, in school business, you know, you're looking at 20, 30-year loans. And uh, so uh, taking care of the taxpayers' dollars has been uh, done very well by by this group, and I just want to throw some kudos out to, to them. They did a great job. Thank you, Dr. Beresford. I appreciate you bringing that up, and I appreciate um, your comment about how well we take care of our facilities, because later on this, after, or this evening, I'm going to be talking about a bill which is going to, if passed, remove our ability to take care of our facilities. So, moving on. I know that's not good. Um, moving on to policy, you know, last month, the policy committee headed by Dr. Dudley brought several policies to us, and so we are going to revisit those today. So the first is the adoption of policy 4216, dress and grooming. Yes, thank you. Um, and so as you correctly stated last month, our policy committee brought several policies for review. And I do want to make mention um, of policy 4215, use of tobacco. That one you will not see on the agenda this evening. We did bring that last time, but it was determined that we are making no changes there. So that is not on the agenda for this evening. So policy 4216, the policy committee reviewed this and um, is recommending to approve the revisions made to this policy. And the revisions include alignment with all of our student handbooks as well. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. May I get a motion on the table to approve um, changes to policy 4216? So moved. Second? Thank you. Discussion? All those in favor of supporting the changes to policy 4216, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0.
Next, we have policy 4514, student use of bicycles. Yes, thank you. And so this policy um, is the use of bicycles, and this policy is actually addressed in all of our student handbooks, and so it is the recommendation that we delete this from board policy, and it is it covered in our student handbook. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. We have a recommendation to, del to delete policy 4514, student use of bicycles. May I get a motion on the table? So moved. Second. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Louise. Yay. Um, discussion. Oh, no discussion. Okay. In the, we have no discussion. All those in favor of deleting policy 4514, student use of bicycles, signify by saying aye. 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 Looks like motion carries 5 0. Next, we have adoption, well, actually, adoption of the deletion of policy 4514.01, student use of motor vehicles. Yes, and this policy, again, is um, actually pertaining only to the high school, and it is addressed in the high school um, student handbook, and so the policy committee is um, recommending that we um, delete this from board policy. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. May I get a motion on the table for policy 4514.01? So Second. Thank you, Katie. Discussion. All those in favor of deleting policy 4514.01, student use of motor vehicles, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Next, we have policy 4230, Dr. Dudley. Yes, and this policy is um, pertaining to late arrival and early dismissal of students. The policy committee reviewed this policy and are recommending some changes be made to this policy. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. Make it a motion on the table to approve changes to policy 4230. Thank you, Katie. Second. Thank you, Pam. Discussion? Pam? Didn't we change the title of this? Yes, we're changing it to, um, we can't change it actually in the tool until we get there. It's um, partial absence during the school day. Yep. Could you repeat that, please? Partial absence during the school day. If you look at the okay. copy you have, mm -hmm. right at the title, it says um, we're changing it from late arrival and early dismissal to partial absence during the school day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? Thank you. All those in favor of updates to policy 4230, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Next, we have policy 4330, use of medications policy. Yes, and so this policy is pertaining to the use of medication um, within our schools, and the policy committee is, um, has made some recommendations for revisions for this policy, and we recommend that those re revisions are approved. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. May I get a motion on the table to approve revisions to policy 4330? So moved. Pam? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Any discussion? Wait, did you get a second? Yes, Katie second. Okay. You, you first, Katie second, yes. Discussion? All those in favor of supporting updates to policy 4330, use of medication policy, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have policy 4130, withdrawal from school. Yes, thank you. This policy was also reviewed by the policy committee and suggested revisions um, are made and it's recommended that the board approve the proposed revisions. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. I get a motion on the table to approve revisions to policy 4130. So moved. Thank you, Pam. Second. Thank you, Katie. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of Changes to policy 4130, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. 
Next, we have policy 4200, the attendance policy. Dr. Dudley. Thank you. This policy, again, was reviewed by the policy committee and um, made some revisions, and it's recommended that those revisions are approved by the board. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. I get a motion on the table to approve revisions to policy 4200, attendance policy. So moved. Thank you, Pam. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Katie. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you, and I'm new to the policy committee, so it's not me at all, um, for reviewing the policies um, in accordance with the handbooks, which the board recently voted on. So I just want to appreciate the work that's been done prior to me and right now to continue to make sure that these two things are aligned. So this um, one that we're voting on right now is a great example of how we're making that happen. So just a kudos. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Mike. Well, I had two comments. Um, the first one was really a thank you to the policy committee. Um, last time we had all these policies advanced and we had a uh, discussion over those and some concern about deleting policies and just leaving them in the handbook. So I appreciate the fact that we had that discussion and that the committee looked at them and came back. Um, and you kind of stole my thunder because I wanted to say, I noticed the use of tobacco one was not <laughs> on the agenda for this evening, so I appreciate that. And then with this specific policy, um, there is a the reference to the code that says exceptions to compulsory attendance that may be recognized on the school corporation as um, stated in Indiana code. Um, and the last two is 14-17. I believe it really should be 14 through 17 because those are the policies 14, 15, 16. Those are the code sections 14, 15, 16, 17 that we're relying on and so that it looks confusing that there isn't such a code section with all of those. Is it a dash? Well, but the all of the sections are... Whatever the code is, there's only four sections. So instead of a dash, I think it should be a word through because we're referencing all of those, whatever, 14, 15, 16, 17, four code sections, not just one code section. Okay, we can make that adjustment. Thank you. Any other comments at this time? Okay, thank you, Mike. Hearing none, let's go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of supporting revisions to policy 4200, attendance policy, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries, 5-0. And last but not least, we have policy 4217, weapons. Yes, thank you. And the policy committee reviewed this policy as well and um, made some proposed revisions, and we are um, recommending that you um, adopt those revisions. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. Making a motion on the table to approve revisions to policy 4217, weapons. So moved. Thank you, Pam. Second. Thank you, Katie. Discussion. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of supporting revisions to policy 4217, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Dr. Dudley, for your thorough work, and Pam and Katie. Next, we have our discussion. And for discussion, we actually turn to Dr. Dudley as well for study change addendum. Yes, thank you. So um, each year in October, I bring to the board um, the proposed course of studies for Carmel High School. And um, this year, we actually had some changes to those proposed course of studies that um, are not changes in the curriculum, but they are changes in some titles, as well as um, changes in two of the courses to be offered in them as dual credit courses uh, through Ivy Tech, as well as through um, IU. And these course changes, or the changes to the titles, they came after we went through our whole um, curriculum advisory and program of study adoption. However, it does line up, the changes in the names line up to our um, career and technical education next level course titles. And as our students are lining up for their graduation pathways and working through those next level um, career and technical education, it um, makes sense to align them. So changing those course titles makes sense. 
So we've changes in um, principles of marketing to change that to marketing fundamentals. And that also adds a dual credit through Ivy Tech for our students. Computer Science 1 is not a um, title change, but it is adding a dual credit through IU um, Indiana University. Culinary Arts and Hospitalities would be changing to Principles of Culinary and Hospitality. And this lines up with our um, PTE next level course titles, as well as the next several ones. The Introduction to Construction um, changes to Principles of Construction Trades. Introductions to Transportation changes to Principles of Automotive Services. Introduction to Manufacturing changes to Principles of Advanced Manufacturing. And stud Student Media changes to principles of radio and TV. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. I open the floor up to discussion and questions. Um, here. Let me see if I can find it. I just had a question about student media um, because we have title changes and modifications of the existing course, and then you've got student media, and then you've got all the other the component that it that it surrounds, like beginning radio. Why don't we just title the courses like beginning radio, intermediate radio, advanced radio, rather than all of them student media? So the the new title will change to principles of radio and TV, and then it'll still have beginning radio, intermediate radio. That'll be after the hyphen. That will all still change, stay the same. And the reason we're changing those is the state has certain titles for courses in their um, curriculum that they approved a curriculum, and we want to make sure that our courses align with the state course title. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions at this time? Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Dudley. That you did a great job presenting because you've left us speechless. <laughs> and <laughs> not quite, almost. <laughs> Next on the agenda, we have reports. And our beginning report is our student data report, our impact of COVID-19 on student achievement. Dr. Dudley. Thank you. Okay, so this evening I want to um, talk to you a little bit about our, um, our impact on um, COVID-19. And I'm sure you've heard and read a lot about, they talk about the COVID slide or the COVID slowdown and learning loss. And as you'll recall, about this time last year, we changed from in-person learning to virtual learning. We had a few days where we were working on um, developing what that curriculum would look like, and then we went to 100% virtual learning very quickly. Um, our teachers and our administrators did a fabulous job of switching gears and, and moving that into action, um, but we, and we learned a lot. And you um, saw through several different board reports that we did throughout that time and also this year of the things that we learned um, from that virtual learning and um, how we could make that better. But we really wanted to look at, okay, what is that um, impact from switching from, we went to school up until March, and then the last nine weeks of school, we changed to virtual learning. And right now, let me share with you, the data I'm going to share with you is a very small group, a data set, because our data is still, we're, we're still looking at that data. The data I'm sharing with you tonight is looking at our students that have come back from virtual learning from last spring and they've come back full time. And those are our students that are in our elementary schools that have come back to in person all day, every day. Because we, we, as you know, at our middle schools and our high schools, we have the hybrid model going on. And then we also have students at, from K-12 that are also in that virtual piece. And the data that we're going to talk about tonight is not including those groups of students, and I'll talk about why. So as we looked at the data, we wanted to say, what, what could we or what might we expect from our moving to that virtual learning? And so we looked at the research. Um, we found a really good research report done through NWEA where they looked at um, a variety of students' test scores over years and tried to predict the um, determination of what 
um, the COVID slide or the um, COVID slowdown might be by looking at the research that has been well documented looking at the summer slide or the summer slowdown. So as you may um, know, as students go home for the summer, you may hear they have um, learning loss over the summer years. So they looked at that data and then they predicted what might it, what might we expect for this COVID slide? And what they found that um, is very clear in the data with that summer loss is that typically you see achievement that it typically slows or declines over the summer. So going from the last nine weeks to uh, virtual and through the summer, so we went nine weeks virtual and then eight weeks of summer, um, we could expect some slows or declines in their learning. Also, um, typically they see in the summer loss that there are steeper declines in math as compared to reading. Um, and also they look at in the research that the extent of the loss is, um, increases proportionately as the students get older or through the upper grades. So we wanted to first look at is our data um, comparable to that at all? And so what this first slide shows you is these are our elementary students that are now in person. And this first um, point up here is showing our students in um, where they were in fall of 1920. So this is all before COVID. This is the average percentile for our elementary students in math is the yellow and in dark blue is, the, is reading. And so you can see our students in math, it, the average percentile for our elementary students was 74.7 percentile and in the fall of 1920. The winter of 1920, we moved up to 75.3 percentile. And then we had our, we went to um, virtual learning and then through the summer. And so for the fall of 2021, you can see this um, dip down to 70.8%, and this is our average of all of our elementary students. But by the winter of this year, um, 2021, we just took this back in January, you can see we've bounced back up to a 73.5 percentile in math. So we are seeing a larger dip in math than we are in reading. You can see the scores in reading. We did have a dip from um, the winter of 1920 to the fall of 2021. You can see that dip, but it wasn't quite as large as our math dip. And then we've bounced back, and in our reading, where the average is right back to where we started, where we were last winter, as you can see. So then we wanted to look at what does it look like over um, different grade levels. So as you can see in this slide here, we have our um, different grade levels across um, we see our largest decline, and this is in reading. Our largest decline we see in our um, first grade students. That is the dark blue one up here, where in winter of 2021 we were at 74.5, and we dropped all the way down to 70.2 down here, and we've bounced back to the 72.3. You can see our second grade students, we were, it wasn't so hot back in the fall and the winter of last year. We did see a dip, but you can see back in our winter of um, this year, we have bounced back and we're above where we were at. So that was some interesting. And then it looks like our um, fourth and fifth grade are, we're almost flatlined right here throughout the middle of our data. And so then looking at math, you can see we are seeing some um, larger declines, just as the research um, would tell us to expect. As you can see in our first grade, we did see um, quite a large decline. Um, and we're moving, we've moved back up there, but we're not quite back where we were at the winter of um, 1920 in our decline. So that's looking at the averages of all of our elementary students. So now let's look at um, what as we drill down more, look at the data in just a little bit of a different way. And so the next um, several data slides that I'm going to share with you, as I said, these data slides are our, our current first through fifth grade in-person students. These are students that are attending every day. Um, it does not include any of our students that um, have been virtual in the elementary school or any of our students that have been virtual and then came in person or um, came in person and then went virtual. And the reason for that is 
For the data that we're looking at, we're looking at our NWA map growth data. We did give um, NWA map growth for it at the elementary for both our in-person and also our virtual students. However, our virtual students, we, we need to look at that data. It was not given in standard form where students were in the classroom taking it. They were taking it at home. And so we, um, looking at that data, we need to look at that as um, it, it does inform the instruction, but we can't use it as a standard measure as with the other students. So that's why it's only looking at our in-person student we're very um, excited to see when we come back in person next year to look at what will our um, data look like for our middle school students as well as our high school students and then also um, for our virtual elementary students as well. And we'll um, be very quick to look at that data for our NWA. At the high school, we'll look at our PSAT data um, and we'll look at different measures that we have. But for right now, what we're looking at this evening is just for our elementary in-person students. And the data that we have, I, as I said, this is looking at our NWA map growth data and is comparing the 2019 percentile score compared to where the student is in the winter 2021 score. So what we looked at is we looked at all of the students of where they were, what was their percentile in fall of 2019-20, and what is their percentile now in um, winter of 2021, their most recent data. We compared those two percentiles to say, what is the student above where they were last fall? Is the student approaching almost to where they were last fall? Or is the student below? So if the student is above, that winter um, 2021 is above the fall 20, um, 2019 percentile, it is rated as above. If it's approaching, this is looking at the um, 2021 percentile compared to the 19 percentile, the fall of 19 percentile, and it's looking between zero and a minus six percentile points. Or if it's below, we're looking at minus six and below when you're comparing those two scores. And one other piece that I want to share with you too that does um, really look um, very different because we desegregated this data through um, a variety of populations as well as a variety of ethnicities. And as I said, this data is looking at our students that are in person at the elementary. And 25% of the students at the elementary at some point in time were virtual. That's not to say right now 25% of them are virtual, but 25% at some point in time they were virtual um, either they started virtual and moved to in-person or they've been virtual the whole time or they've been, they went um, in-person and moved to virtual. So this is looking at 75% of our current students and these are students that are in-person and have been in-person all year. But the other interesting piece to look at is when you compare our in-person students at the elementary with our virtual students at the elementary and you look at their ethnicity. Um, we do have quite a um, difference in the population. As you can see, our in-person um, students, our white students, we have about 80% of our white students are in-person as compared to 37% are virtual. Um, as far as our Asian students, 7% of our Asian students are in-person as compared to 43% of our Asian students are virtual. And then 2% um, of our black students are in person as compared to 7% um, of our black students are virtual. So those are some um, bigger changes in the two groups. When I looked at male and female, they were about the same in person virtual. When I looked at special population, those were about equivalent as well. But this one was um, quite a big change. So I wanted you to be aware of that as we're looking at these next slides. We're looking at the in person one and just the, change, the differences in the ethnicities when we get to that slide. So looking at our in-person um, students by grade level, this is looking at their reading um, percentile. And again, it's comparing where they were back in the fall of 2019 to where they are right now in the winter of 2021. And you can see on this slide, it shows our students are um, about 30% of our students are not back in first grade or not back to where they were last fall. About 58% of our students are either at or above where they were last fall. So they've regained 
any learning loss that they might have had. As you can see, we go through the grade levels of, as we get up to fifth grade, we can see we have more in that um, approaching or um, below level where they haven't regained as much um, as quickly as our younger grades. So then looking at our male and female um, population in the area of reading, we're about the same. As you can see where our students are, um, the ones that are below, approaching and above male and female, we don't see um, very big differences in um, those two populations when we look at gender. So looking at our special populations, as you can see, we're looking at, first we're comparing all of our students as compared to our high ability, our students that um, are special education, our English learners, and our free and reduced students. And one of the things that you uh, may notice that stick out um, quite a bit here is our um, high ability students, where we have um, quite a large um, percentage of our students in that approaching area where they've not uh, moved back to um, their gains. And so some of the pieces are, you know, one of the things we're looking at is looking into why might that be um, the case in our high ability where our high ability students are not um, making those gains back as compared to some of our other special population groups. And we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing and how we're looking into all of these um, different data sources. And so here is our um, group as we're looking at reading and we're um, looking at our different ethnicities. And as you can see that we do have a disparity with our black students. Um, we have a much larger percentage in the below or in also in the approaching area as compared with our other students. And so looking into that data as well as our Hispanic students as well, um, there is an achievement gap there as well as we're noticing. So then moving into math, um, you can see our math data across the grades uh, fairly equal, where in fifth grade, again, um, it's a little bit less um, as compared to our reading data as well. And then when we look at our male and female, we are seeing um, a bit more disparity between our female students as compared to our male students in the area of math. And then looking at our populations, again, our special populations, um, we are seeing a larger disparity in our free and reduced um, students or in the area of math as well. And then again, looking over across at our um, different ethnicities, we are seeing um, quite a disparity with our black students as well in the area of math. So now it's really looking at what, what are we doing um, and how are we responding to this. And so one of the pieces that we're looking at in responding to this, and this is something that um, we delve into and we really want to look at how do we um, make sense of the data. And again, this is one data point that we're looking at. And uh, one of the pieces is, is we really take a deep dive into what is this data telling us. And we do this through um, the use of collaborative inquiry. And so that's where we really we examine not only the student achievement data, but we examine our um, curriculum. We examine the pedagogy or the instruction. We examine um, dispositions that's happening in the classrooms and the behaviors that are happening in the classrooms. And we see, you know, what might be some, um, are we replicating some systematic inequalities within those classrooms? And so we've taken a, a really deep dive into this piece. And we do that through that collaborative inquiry. And so that's where we have teachers coming together with administrators and really looking at um, how are we going to identify and then close those gaps between those results for our students and our current practices and how can we then can replicate those practices that are making a difference for our students. And we want to dig into those gaps and so understand what is happening and then how can we change it. And that is an ongoing process that um, we're using in many of the things as we talk about in different reports, you might see um, examples of that. As I said, you know, one of the pieces as we really dig into that in collaborative inquiry and we look at the, um, the pedagogy and the instruction in the curriculum, one of the pieces that has come out of that is really looking at that structured literacy instruction. 
and making sure that we're using that code-based explicit systematic instruction that is sequential. Because as we look at our students, one of the things that um, we found as we really dug into um, the instructional practices that were going on is we looked at our students, um, many, really our instruction was based more on a broad instruction where we were affecting about 40% of our students, our students that are up here in this area, that they would um, be advantaged by having a structured literacy approach. But our literacy instruction, as we found, as we dug into um, the program evaluation and looked at our um, instruction, especially in our elementary areas, we saw that we are doing more broad instruction. We were not as systematic as we needed to be. And so one of the um, pieces that we've um, started to implement and we will continue to implement next year is that really the um, using that code-based, explicit, systematic, and sequential instruction. And that, um, in doing so, we are going to make sure that we are um, catching our students down here that will really benefit from that. And these students will still be um, um, be advantaged by that as well. So we will raise the literacy instruction for all of our students. So that is one area that we um, have started changing last year and will continue. Um, later this spring, I'll bring um, some adoption materials that we'll be looking at for our um, early elementary to make sure that we have a very um, sequential, systematic program in place that's happening. Another area, and you've heard me talk about this as well, that we look at, as I said, the data that I shared with you this evening is at a very high level. It is one data point. But that MTSS really leads to that collaborative inquiry where we dig down and we look at each individual student. And we look at all of the data that we have on that student to say, what is it that this student needs and what um, supports um, does this student need that we need to wrap around? And when we look at the MTSS, that's multi-tiered systems of support, it's not just looking at their academic needs, but it's also looking at their behavioral needs as well as their social emotional needs. Because we know if our students are not um, feeling safe and secure in the classroom, then learning is not going to happen. And so sometimes we need to take care of some other needs before we can dig into the academic needs. And so that MTSS process and that collaborative inquiry really works at um, drilling down and determining what are the specific needs for the individual student. Another area that we're responding to is extended intervention opportunities. So we have intervention that happens throughout um, all of our buildings. Um, but because of COVID and because of us moving into not only last um, fall or last spring into virtual learning, but our students that are now on a hybrid system and our students that are 100% virtual, um, how can we offer um, additional interventions and additional supports? And we've already started putting some of these in place where um, at the high school for our virtual students, we have opened up um, tutoring sessions in the evening at our CLC program. We have teachers over there that we um, have currently that um, are over there to help with our homebound students. But because we have more virtual students, we don't have as many homebound students. So we've repurposed um, their use and we've set up um, tutoring slots that have been, um, our students have taken quite a lot of advantage of that and they're very excited to go and get the help. And so these are for our virtual students that have the opportunity to work with teachers in the evening um, in tutoring slots to get the support that they might need that otherwise they're not getting. And so that's one piece that we've already started to put in place. Um, a couple other things is we're um, determining the um, if students would be interested, if parents would be interested in starting yet after spring break some additional after school tutoring options at both our middle schools as well as our high schools to bring our students in and especially looking at, at the high school, looking at our students that um, are at risk at not finishing courses, especially looking at our seniors that might be at risk at not um, completing all of their credits required for graduation, and rather wait until waiting until summertime, we're looking at the possibility of bringing them in in the afternoon um, to make sure we're getting them caught up, getting that credit recovery done so that our students will graduate um, in a timely manner. Um, so we're looking at those extended intervention opportunities, not only this spring, but then 
through the summer as well as um, into next year. And then, of course, um, also looking at summer learning opportunities. Last year, um, you may remember, I reported on, we had a summer school for our, their, our intensive students that are at risk from moving from second grade into third grade. Um, and I wish this meeting would be tomorrow because we actually get the I read results, the preliminary I read results tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so I can't share with you how our students did. But looking at their NWA data for our students that were in that very intensive summer school group that we did with our youngest, some of our youngest learners, um, we had um, more than 66% of those students actually met their growth goals this winter. And so we're very excited to see that they are back where they need to be. Um, not only are they back where they need to be, but they've made um, quite a bit of gains in that accelerated learning. And part of that was due to um, the intensive support that they had. So um, fortunately, we just actually, Jen Penix um, helped us write a grant through Duke Energy um, for this year's summer learning, where we, and we did, um, we will receive $20,000 to help support. Um, that will be in the area of decodable text to help support summer learning, because we're planning to um, do this again with our students that are in first grade going into second grade, our students that are uh, very at risk, and to give them very specific instruction in literacy area. And so um, we're excited that um, we've, uh, we have that grant from Duke Energy to help support, they'll help support some of the materials for that. We also will have um, offer continuation of learning for our students that are in credit recovery at the high school that or our students that are either in credit recovery or in just a regular Edmentum course that maybe they haven't finished the course, they'll have the opportunity to come in in the summer and um, instead of starting over again, they'll have time to finish that course. So they will receive an incomplete at the end of um, the spring semester and then they'll go back and change the grade once the student completes their course. And so they'll have that um, opportunity to get that support at the high school. And then we also will have our um, summer courses that we offer through IOA or Indiana Online Academy where our students, some of our students like to accelerate in the areas of PE so they have more room in their schedule. But we also have students that um, retake courses because they did not receive the grade that they wanted where they received a lower grade and they need to retake that course and we will offer that as well in those summer opportunities. So with that, what questions might you have? There was a lot of information. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Dudley. Louise? Um, first of all, thank you so much, Amy. That was very thorough. Um, Dr. Dudley, um, I just have a couple of basic questions. So one is, yeah, can you hear me? One is um, the tutoring that you're offering. Is that free of charge? Yes, so any of the um, tutoring that we have in the evening right now at CLC, that is that is all free of charge. And then if um, we do that after school, starting after spring break, those will be our instructional assistants and our students will be able to sign up um, for that small one-on-one -on -one or small group and it will all be free of charge for our students. And at all levels, elementary, middle, and... and not at elementary. We're looking at that. In, we're investigating that in our middle school and our high school level for our virtual learners as well as our hybrid learners that might need some more support. Okay. And then is that in-person and virtual? Well, we're looking at... We're um, looking at the possibility of doing it all in person. We can do um, virtual, but we want to see, will, you know, would our um, parents feel comfortable bringing their virtual students if it was a one-on-one, -on -one, a very small group um, in person? Because we feel like that can be a better um, fit, but then we can also modify if people are not feeling comfortable with that. Okay. And then last question is, um, for the after-school opportunities for teachers, have we, I mean, for students, have we looked at um, late buses, are, that, are they right. offered? So, so far this year we have not had a late bus because of contact tracing, but that was something I talked to with Mr. McMichael um, that we may have a need if we have the need of um, the students having that because they may, especially our middle school students, um, typically need that late bus opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. Dr. Dudley, I was wondering when you were showing the percentages of um, you know, different student cohorts 
that we're not succeeding as much as other groups. Um, were those percentages, have you been able to look at specific schools? Were those percentages, I appreciate that that was just everybody, mm -hmm. but as you pull it apart and you know dissect that just a little more, is it different at different schools or is it basically the same? So we have not, as you're correctly stated, that is all of our students, we've not um, pulled it apart by grade level by the different groups, nor by the different schools. As of yet, that's another deep dive to look at. Will you at some point be doing a deeper dive looking yes. at that to see if there are different instructional models that perhaps have been more successful in different school districts? Right. Or different in, in our elementary schools, our um, curriculum and our, the instructional models are very similar. Um, and that is where we, and, and we work hard to make sure that we have that because we want to make sure that whether our student as is at um, Talmetto Elementary School or at Prairie Trace Elementary School, they still get that guaranteed viable curriculum. They still get, so the curriculum is based on um, the literacy curriculum, you know, they all use the same materials as far as Lucy Calkins um, reading and Lucy Calkins writing. They all use everyday math. Um, they're working on using our project Lead the Way in Science. That's another area. Social Studies is the TCI curriculum. So the curriculum is very similar and then the instructional practices um, are, are similar as well. So we try to make sure that we have that um, at all 11 of our elementary schools. However, we, do, we will see different changes. And then as our schools all work, they'll use this data as well as a lot of other data as they look to their school improvement plans. And then they, they do, we dig down deep in all of that data pieces to say, okay, where are the needs at each individual school? And then what um, pieces do we need to put in place to improve that? Also, did NWA provide any data nationally what these trends have been in other school districts? Did they, is that something we could even look at? I don't know that it's necessarily important, but I think it would be interesting to see where we measure up as compared to other school districts. So NWA does have a variety of different um, studies out there. The study that I was sharing with you was really looking at their prediction of using what the um, well-researched summer slide piece and predicting what that would look like with COVID. One of the problems with, with NWA is, um, not a problem with NWA, but with there's so many different um, scenarios. For example, many schools completely shut down. Some schools went to, they didn't have the capability of doing virtual, so they might have done paper pencil packets um, for the learning. So there's so many different scenarios. It would be difficult to find one that was exactly like our scenario, but that is something we can certainly look to. I also want to thank you for the information and the report and realize that we're just looking at very limited data at this point. Um, and I think it's important to note that those graphs that you showed at the beginning, the first couple, look like they're very dramatic losses. But if you look at the numbers, we're actually talking one or two percent. So from this one data point, it doesn't look like we've had the great loss that we feared. And so it's comforting to me to know that, I mean, yes, there was a loss. Yes, this was a traumatic event. Um, for our students, but for the most part, at least on this, they are coming back. Correct. Yes, we are seeing um, that regain in that learning. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Um, we do give NWEA in middle school as well? Yes, we do. This year, we did not oh. give NWEA. Typically, we give NWEA kindergarten through eighth grade, and then we give it in some courses at the high school, but not all courses. Um, at the high school. Uh, but this year, because of the hybrid schedule and because of the limited time seeing the students, um, we determined that it wasn't in the best interest of the students to give NWA in lieu of instructional time. So we did not give it this year. So how will we determine learning loss in the middle school? So, so next fall, we will go back to giving NWA, and then we can compare it to where they were a year ago, the their data from the 1920 school year. Okay, so we won't know if there's, so right now, if they if they're supposed to go to uh, after school or summer school, 
we will rely on the teacher data? Well, as, as we look at for the middle school, as we look at um, after school opportunities for them, we'll look at students that are um, either uh, virtual students or hybrid students that are struggling, students that need more additional help. And so we can look at other data. We can look at um, their classroom grades, um, you know, their test scores, and what have you. So that'll come through a teacher recommendation? Correct. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Katie? Um, my question is actually for Dr. Beresford. Um, we've had discussions about um, the future of our strategic plan and all the things and kind of this recovery pattern of um, coming back from COVID. Could you kind of give a little bit more of like kind of the thought process with that in addition in light of what we've learned about tonight? Yeah, it's, it's still a work in progress, but one of the thoughts that we've had and discussed a little bit was that, um, you know, when, when COVID finally comes to an end, the, the stressor is leaving, but the stress remains. So uh, uh, there'll be a lot of impacts that I think we'll need to recover from. Uh, you've seen Amy go through quite a few, um, you know, slides on, on what we're seeing elementary-wise with the numbers that we have. We've been fortunate to have, uh, you know, everyday program for the elementary kids from day one this school year so I I was ex I was excited to see those numbers because it looks like we're, we're getting back where we need to be uh, but at the same time um, we we don't we won't know the full impact until we've got an opportunity to you know to really evaluate how kids are doing um, so um, that piece of it and then also you know our teachers have taken a, have, a, have had a year of a lot of load as well as our administrators and that sort of thing and uh, we have financial recovery to do. We've spent what close to three million, closing on three million dollars uh, out of our budget to uh, to be able to to run the programs that we've been able to run for the last year year and some change. So yeah, the recovery piece is uh, is a focal point, and uh, we're trying to put together pieces of what that might look like uh, for our students, for our staff, and and then uh, and really for our, even our families and community because we've been through a lot. Thank you. And then my last question, um, Dr. Dudley, is if a parent um, feels like their child is struggling, if they're not doing what um, they believe, either academically or emotionally, where should they go? Where should the parents turn to? Sure. I, and, and I would suggest that they go with to their teacher or to their counselor um, and, and share their concerns, and then they can look at what supports they might be able to wrap around to help that student to be successful. Thank you. Louise? Um, so with the middle school, um, us pivoting and not providing the standard NWE test, is there some kind of protocol or standard direction we can give to our educators in terms of what they should be reporting to parents um, and, and, and a measure of, you know, if a student is doing X, Y, or Z, we need you to reach out to parents? I'm just aware of parents that are trying to balance things with, you know, pivoting with COVID and they may not be aware of certain things. Is there some kind of standard practice we have for the middle school students? Right. Well, and, and I would say for our, our middle school students and all of our students, you know, really looking at their, um, their work that they're turning in, looking at their, you know, are they turning it in or are they missing assignments, looking at their grades, um, their grades on not only projects in the classroom, but their grades on um, assessments that they're giving on the, um, you know, our summative assessments on different unit tests and things to say, are the students learning? Are they, do they need some more support in those pieces? Um, and really having, you know, keeping close watch as far as our parents using the tools in um, power to parents tools so they can look at their grades to make sure that the students are keeping up with their work. Because I think one of the, the biggest things we've seen is we have some students that are really thriving and um, really like that every other day, and they're able to get all of their work done. But we have other students that are struggling, especially some of our middle school students that might be struggling with that time management and those executive functioning pieces and really helping our students to stay up on it. And I know our teachers are working on helping our students to stay organized in that area, but then also um, you know, having the parents stay up and current on where the students are as, as far as their work goes. So I hear you saying you have asked teachers to provide that feedback. So if 
parents aren't getting that feedback, we're asking parents to follow the teachers? Is that what it is? Or we don't have a standard that we've communicated? Is, I just want to know what's the standard that we've asked for. As far as feedback on grades for students? Well, as far as um, how a student is performing in terms of if they're not performing at the, the level that they should be, right. what's the standard? Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, like the grade, our report cards just went out. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, as our parents um, are viewing those and looking at, you know, how our students typically have done yeah. and then how are our students doing now, that, that is one key um, area. And then our middle school students also, at the end, in the middle of April, they will take iLearn as well as another, um, and that will be a standardized test and all of our students will take that, even our virtual students, they'll come in to take that test as well as another measure. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for Dr. Dudley at this time? Great, well thank you very much, Dr. Thank Dudley. You. We appreciate this insight and um, look forward to how we're going to continue to support our students. Next on the agenda, we have our monthly financial update. To that, we turn to Mr. McMichael. All right, so um, I'll begin by noting that uh, this year we are um, looking at our education fund, the, the referendum, and then we've added the rainy day fund as uh, previously discussed. So we're through February, and um, you can see from this slide that um, combining those three funds, uh, our cash balance uh, is declining, which it always does primarily because of the, uh, we, we received the uh, referendum funding um, through property tax, which is primarily twice a year, and so that is expected that, that the balances will go down, and then they'll come back up in May and June. Um, compare that to last year, which does not include the rainy day fund, and uh, so we were at 2.6 million, uh, but you'll see in a minute that uh, we have a couple million dollars in the rainy day fund, so that's significantly contributing to that cash balance. In the operations fund, uh, we're at just over five hundred thousand um, dollars, and that you may recall that we, uh, in December, we transferred three million dollars from the operations fund to the rainy day fund, and um, and so even doing that, we're still uh, ahead of last year. Last February, we were uh, in the negative by $206,000 in the operations fund. So here's the rainy day fund, and, and uh, you can see we have an ending cash balance of just under $2.3 million. And um, the expenditures out of this fund, there will not be more money go into this fund until unless until we transfer more from the from the operations fund. But uh, uh, we're not ready to, to recommend that just yet. And the expenses that you're seeing here are for the additional teachers um, and, and IAs uh, as a result of COVID. And so it's not the total expense for COVID, but it is for the, for specific to the additional teachers and, and the IAs. Um, and then again, you can see from last year, uh, which is the first time that we had put funds in the rainy day fund, um, so we started with, with the $3 million So with that, I will uh, respond to any questions that you might have. Well, thank you, Roger. I do not have any questions at this time. Do other board members have any questions they 
And so, Ms. McMichael, thank you very much for providing us some insight as well. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have board member reports. We have a legislative report and then a report from Kamakwit Parks Department. So we will start with the legislative report, which is myself. Um, I sent a letter or a, a report to everybody earlier today, and um, there's two parts to the report that I did share. The first part really identifies um, several policies or several bills that align with what we were hoping to seek from this legislative session with regards to flexibility and local governance. Um, and, and, and each section aligns with the letter and the discussion points that we had with our legislators. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few and then I'll discuss some pretty significant concerns that I have on the back of the page that I had shared earlier. So um, first, I do want to share that it is anticipated that the budget, there'll be a vote on the budget in early April. So that's pretty exciting. Um, hopefully, so um, we'll have more information by the 12th of April. And our legislative letter, you know, we were seeking some flexibility with local governance. Um, I would like to point out that um, school accountability, House Bill 1214, removes a letter grade for our academic year. So that is, well, we're happy about that. And then there's two bills that really provide us the opportunity to continue having electronic meetings. Um, House Bill 1437, which did receive um, um, support at its last reading in the Senate. Um, back on the 18th of March, and then Senate Bill 369 also has um, components in that to support the electronic meetings and signatures. We were seeking liability shield for COVID, and that has already been signed into law by the governor, so we do have some civil liability related to COVID-19. Um, so modernizing accountability and assessment. There are two bills, one House Bill 1514, which we discussed, which will eliminate um, letter grades for this academic year, for the 2021 academic year. The other, Senate Bill 413, Education Matters. Well, there is a small portion in there that will um, nullify grades for the 1920, or the 2020-21 school year, but that particular bill also proposes an expansion of the choice scholarships, which we definitely oppose. Um, so that's just something that we need to watch for. But there are several other bills out there that do eliminate a letter grade for this upcoming year. So that I'm hopeful that that will, will um, make its way into law. We are pretty excited about the student support. We have House Bill 1431, which is the Department of Child Services and the Education Committee. And what that will, if it passes, and it looks pretty good, it will provide um, a, a seat at the table for somebody from the school district to better understand what's going on with the students so we can support those students in the classroom. So that really is a, really a good thing for the mental health of our kids. Um, there is Senate Bill 19, which requires information on the student ID card. And that's getting that has some traction, and that will provide the suicide prevention phone number as well as the human trafficking phone number. So our students have that resource at their disposal, and that would be anywhere from sixth grade through 12th grade. That would be on the back of their ID card in some form. Um, and then lessons learned from COVID-19, that is really something that we were certainly pushing for. What is it that we've learned through the course of this year that we can put into law that really would benefit not only our school district, but other school districts as well. A few things, um, the funding for virtual instruction, and that should be signed into law um, this upcoming week. So 100% funding for public schools that are providing virtual instruction. Um, the current law states that we'd only get 85% funding for students. So that is fantastic and very helpful. Um, that The other one is House Bill 1008 
which is a student learning recovery grant program that has a lot of traction. We're excited about that. And that will put up to $150 million from the state budget into this grant program for um, enrichment because of COVID learning loss. So a couple things that I wanted to be sure that I brought to our, your attention, as well as, um, I know ISBA has brought it to my attention, as well as um, Seamus with KGR. The couple things, the Education Building and Transportation Authorities is the title of House Bill 1266. Um, this bill is new on my radar, and it is certainly one that Trauma Place Schools poses. If the language in this bill does pass, it will remove the oversight of school districts and school administrators and school boards for maintaining our school facilities and our transportation services. Um, which we heard this evening how well, and we are very fortunate that we have, you know, professional staff who've been working with our school district for many years, looking out for the best interest of our tax dollars here in Crown Place Schools, and have been maintaining our facilities. Um, there's no evidence that says that any other for-profit organization could do any better job than we are doing. And um, I'm not quite sure why there is this push, but um, opposition communication has been sent to our state senators because we do not support this. I'll have you know that um, we've got a couple state senators who, no, who do not support this as well, so that is good. Um, Department of Local Finance. This is one that is uh, on my radar as well, House Bill 1271. And what I wanted us to better understand is a concerning part of this is that it's going to change the language, the ballot language for an operating referenda, a renewal referenda, and the safety, refer safety referenda, all of which we have. Um, it eliminates the, the way we state. Well, first, it doubles the length of the question that would appear on the ballot. And in addition to that, it, the language includes an estimated average percentage of property tax increase rather than how it's specifically going to impact an individual taxpayer. You know, right now it's there's so many cents per $100 mm -hmm. of assessed value. Um, the way the language is written, it would be the average for everybody in your area. Well, that, if somebody... It can be artificially inflated or deflated just based on that information. And it's it's not very transparent. It's very misleading. And I'm very concerned about that. And right now, the bill sits at the State Senate and Fiscal Policy Committee. I do not know when that's going to be read again. And um, last but not least, we're just going to highlight Senate Bill 358, vacant or underutilized school buildings. We've sent um, a letter of opposition to our House Education Committee. This bill would require school corporations to offer vacant, vacant or underutilized school buildings to be sold to charter schools for a dollar. Um, and we do not support that whatsoever. The way it would work is that each year we would have to supply to the Indiana Department of Education the percentage of utilization of our schools, any school that is less than 50% utilized could be purchased for a dollar. Um, and that would impact everybody in the state of Indiana. And I just do not think that is an effective way to use um, our taxpayer dollar. They provided, they purchased these buildings and it should not be, a, the ability to sell a building for a dollar is just not an effective use of my, my personal taxpayer dollar, let alone everybody else in our community. So those are a few of the um, tax or the bills that we are following. Um, we have a resolution that we passed this evening, which we will share with the legislators that we um, have been communicating with, also those who are on the important committees, the Education Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, um, I will also share um, communication with the um, ISBA, who's keeping a tally of all of the, the school districts who have adopted. So we will be in uh, 
you know, mass support that we will be sharing that with our community as well as with the state. Um, I guess I open it up for questions, if anybody has any questions at this time. Thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome. Um, I actually enjoy what I do, and I'm enjoying spending some extra time communicating with Dr. Beresford. So it's, it's a good thing. I just hope that um, we see some light at the end of this tunnel. Because oh, it's you. been, yes, yes, agreed. Um, seeing that there aren't any questions, we will move along. And next, we have a Carmel Clay Parks from Miss Louise Jackson. Thank you. Um, I have a brief report. Um, I thought it might be nice to just let people know um, in terms of clubs or summer camps, uh, I think originally we had some concern um, that maybe we might not get as many people excited or have the same level of attendance as in previous years. But now we are at a place where we have about 80 to 90 percent of our camps full. And so we're on the path to having, I think, probably all of those camps full um, for this summer. So if you're, you know, if you have some kids that you might want to get enrolled in some camps, better do that ASAP. Um, but we're just excited to see the popularity of the offerings that we have and optimistic about this summer. So that's it. Thank you. And Louise, this is to you or to Dr. Beresford or Emily. Do we share on our school website some of the links to our, the Parks Department summer camps or does that just go out to our families that participate with the before and after school program? How does that work? Yeah, currently we don't. As a mother myself of someone who does the park summer camps, I do know how quickly they fill up. Um, so if anything, the communication from the parks departments to those who are already using our facilities are typically enough. I could certainly look into if they if there is some extra room this year, let me know and I can I can certainly make a post, but I know especially those specialty camps fill up very quickly so um but i'm sure some of their um more generalized camps if they have extra space and need some promotion i'd be happy to do so thank you yeah, thank you yeah you're right some of them fill up super quick and we didn't send like we didn't send a paper brochure out we did electronic only so i think people are just really eager to get the kids moving about well i just have a comment on that too um it's like buying like concert tickets it's like the slot opens up and you're refreshing and refreshing trying to get your kids in camp. And I think that's a testament to um, Carmel Clay Parks and the relationship we have with our buildings that this is a need for parents. I know I have a need for my kids to attend summer camp because I work full time. I think it's a testament um, just kind of to that great, um, that parents feel safe. I know that I sent my kids this summer with the COVID precautions and I know that they're going to continue that. Um, and then also I just wanted to kind of add too, I know I recently received an email that they're starting to get feedback on ESE for next year. So I know that those conversations and everything are already starting too. So we're very, very thankful for that partnership we have. And thank you for serving on that board. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. Next then we have our superintendent's report, Dr. Beresford. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I knew that tonight's uh, report reports and the meeting was going to go pretty long, so I tried to keep it nice and, and tight for you. But before I start in, I wanted to, to just share that uh, the board and I have received several emails from members of our Asian American and Pacific Islanders community uh, just expressing to us, you know, how difficult this year has been uh, really across the country. And, uh, and I just wanted to share that Carmel Clay Schools today and always will value and celebrate our AAPI students, families, and, and neighbors. Uh, we stand with you against acts of hatred and violence. We affirm our commitment to working together to, to create the best possible environment that we can for our students to learn and grow. Uh, we also want you to know that uh, you can reach out to your school's administrators, um, school counselors, school social workers, for any kind of assistance or support that you might need. Um, we can also connect parents to appropriate age-appropriate resources. Um, we get most of those from the National Association of School Psychologists and they can help you maybe navigate and assist your students through traumatic you know, issues that, that, that occur. Um, I just really, the bottom line is just please know that we're with you and we are here for you. 
Um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll go on with just a couple of events that have occurred. Uh, number one is, uh, I don't know if any of you had the chance to attend Mr. Carmel. Uh, now, I was all set to attend that, and uh, as it turned out, it was the same night as Mrs. B's birthday, and so I made the wise choice and took her out to dinner instead of attending. Uh, but I do want to congratulate um, all to every, all who participated last week in uh, this year's Mr. Carmel. Uh, the high school and the Champions Together worked together. This is a big fundraiser for Champions Together. And they put on this amazing show to, to raise awareness and fundraise. And um, uh, um, CTA President Pete O'Hara was one of the judges in that uh, competition. And, uh, and uh, it is really um, uh, pretty funny. And I've got to know some of the kids that uh, were actually in the program, too. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of silliness. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, but most importantly, they're working with their, their uh, you know, the kids that have uh, maybe some special disabilities. And, uh, and they're raising funds to keep that going. Uh, our whole Champions Together program, which matches um, typical peers with kids with disabilities, and they compete in like flag football and bocce ball and, and basketball and swimming and bowling. Uh, just, uh, it's just, if you can ever get a chance to attend one of those events, I recommend it. It'll, it'll warm your heart. Uh, along the same line, our unified bowling team uh, crushed it. They uh, want to congratulate them. They made it to the state tournament this year and placed sixth. So uh, so there you go. Good good, good job, hounds. Um, I'm going to jump right to the bell ringers. And I had to go plural uh, because there was two things uh, that really caught my attention um, for this board meeting. Uh, one was the boys uh, basketball team. And so for the third consecutive year, um, our Carmel boys basketball team will be headed to the state finals. Um, now, last year we were headed, but it got the season got chopped off. But uh, but uh, Carmel beat Gary Westside in just a real nail biter. Uh, it was an amazing. It was a 53-50 game in overtime, and uh, I got to tell you, um, um, I thought the weekend before was something with the caliber of, of, of basketballs being played. But uh, Gary Westside was an incredible team. I mean, they were big, they were strong, they were fast. Um, it was just it was just like two college teams almost playing against each other, uh, playing way above the rim. I mean, it was just incredible. At, at, when we went into the fourth quarter, late in the fourth quarter, I actually went to one of the assistant principals at the high school to make sure he knew where the AED was because I wasn't sure if my heart could take it and, uh, and uh, you know, so they could respond quickly. But uh, they did pull it out and won, uh, won in overtime, and now they're headed to the state finals. Not this Saturday, but the next Saturday, I think it's April 3rd, where they'll play Lawrence North, uh, another Mick uh, opponent for the state championship. So congratulations to those kids and, uh, and uh, their coaches, and uh, really for both teams. It was a, a really high-caliber basketball game, and uh, it was pretty amazing. But I have one more. That would be uh, congratulations to, to the 2019-20 highlight staff. Uh, so... The awards for student journalism always are a year behind because they have to submit their things, you know, from the year, and then they find out the next year, you know, how they did. Well, um, they earned a gold crown from the Columbia Scholastic Press Association, and the gold crown is their highest honor. So the highlight was one of only 16 national gold crown winners in the hybrid news category in, in the country. And this award marks the sixth gold crown for the highlight in the last nine years. So they also earned some silver ones, which is the second highest um, during that time. But here's where you, what, this, what makes this really special. Um, the gold crown completes the highest, the, the, the highlight from last year, got the highest distinction in every competition that they entered last year. Um, so that includes the, the Indiana High School Press Association, the Hoosier Star, the, the National um, Student Publication Association's Pacemaker Awards. I brought those to you before. It's kind of like the Pulitzer Prize of journalism. And, um, and now this gold crown. So essentially, the, that 2019-20 staff has now, that was a sweep. You know, they swept all the highest distinctions in uh, all the professional organizations. So uh, that just speaks very highly of our student journalists. And uh, I've got to tell you, uh, they're a lot better than some of our professionals right now. So uh, I just want to do a big shout out to the uh, highlight staff, and uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beresford. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. B at this time? 
That's fantastic. Okay. Well, I just want to say it's hard to believe spring break is just one week away. <laughs> For those traveling, please be very safe and practice COVID safety protocols so we keep our community safe when you return. And for those enjoying a staycation, you might want to consider a trip to downtown Indy to watch our, our boys, our um, Carmel High School Greyhound basketball team, men's basketball, as they compete in the state finals. Our next board meeting is Monday the 12th, right here, 7 p.m. And with that, may I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Thank you, Pam. Second. Thank you, Katie. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Meeting adjourned.